The odds against you are crushing. So where does that leave your kids when the dad has no job and no health insurance? You're right. This is crazy. But I can't just sit around and wait for my kids to die. It's a parent's worst nightmare, having two young children with an incurable genetic disorder. I'm A.O. Scott of the New York Times. And I'm Michael Phillips of the Chicago Tribune. In our first movie, Extraordinary Measures, John Crowley, a pharmaceutical executive played by Brendan Fraser, and his wife Eileen, played by Kerry Russell, are faced with the fact that their daughter and younger son have a form of muscular dystrophy called Pompey's disease. Desperate, John seeks out the help of Robert Stonehill, a grouchy genius, played by Harrison Ford. I can promise you longer hours, less money, lousy working conditions, plus when we raise the money, you're going to have to relocate to Nebraska. <laughs> the two men become partners in a startup company that will support Stonehill's research and develop a cure for the disease. They don't always see eye to eye. Stonehill wants to protect his autonomy as a scientist, while John just wants to save his kids. If I can engineer a deal, and that is a really big if, you're going to have to forgive me for all the money I'm going to make you. I don't care about money. I'm a scientist. I care about more important things than that. Don't you tell me about more important things to care about. Eventually, they sell out to a big biotech firm where they encounter a corporate heavy played by Jared Harris. You want this company to sponsor a drug study for two children whose father is an executive of this company? Have you never heard the term conflict of interest? There is strong scientific justification. But you guys just can't go off half cocked without consulting us. You heartless, bloodless machine. Emotional manipulation is par for the course in a movie like this, but I need my mind engaged as well as my heartstrings tugged. And clunky though it often is, Extraordinary Measures passes that test, giving enough insight into the workings of science and business that at the end you feel not only moved, but enlightened. See it. Skip it. Tony, are you telling me if you give this movie, this standard issue weepy, made with no distinction of any kind, a pass, where, you know, the world will be flooded with similarly media Pictures. Well, that will happen yes, anyway. Know. But I actually think that this is is a cut above. I think yes, the the weepy parts, you know, are they kind of take care of themselves. You have you have you know very sick children lying in hospital beds or playing with balloons or remote controlled Barbie doll cars. None of which I believed. I did not believe any of the family behavior in this picture. But that's, that's not that's the point. That's what the movie is actually about. That's interesting and unusual. Is about how you're faced with this problem. You've got two kids who have this terrible disease. Yes. You have this cranky scientist. Right. Um, how do these guys work together, and how do you solve the problem? How do you fund the research? How do you get the you drugs say, to okay, market? Okay, how do you get the clinical all trials of which done? is potentially interesting. Yeah. I think all of it no, is actually no. and, interesting. And, and i got to say, I'm not even sure, as good as they are in many roles, I'm not sure Brendan Fraser and Harrison Ford are working to their best advantage at all here. There's scenes where they really have to kind of bring the anguish and, you know, the head-to-head -head conflict, and they both just seem it's, it's somewhat uncomfortable, and the material does not help them. The director does not help them. I just feel like this film feels like a made-for-TV picture. Not good enough. Not good enough. No, I think, I think it is good enough because I think it does do something that not very many movies that take on this kind of subject, which go for, you know, the yeah. big emotional yeah. crisis yeah. moments do, which is it actually teaches you something about how things work. And, Michael, sometimes I like to learn something when I go to the movies. I, I, the only thing I learned from this one, Tony, is how not to make a movie like this one. Okay, next movie. The startling new British film, Fish Tank, has all the trappings of a bummer, but it's not. The story of sexual awakening is too alive to get bogged down in its own character's circumstances. Mia is a 15-year-old living in the projects with her sister and their mother. Michael Fassbender of Inglorious Bastards plays Connor, mom's new boyfriend, whose affection for this family is not simple. It's a puzzle, Mia. I've got some clothes on. You're half naked. Should we get a move on, yeah? Where are you going? I'm not going nowhere. Well, why did you just say, shall we get a move on, then? Listen, I'm only going for a drive. You want to come? Yes, yes, yes. Both of you? That's newcomer Katie Jarvis as Mia. She's terrific. And a wonderful actress named Kirsten Waring plays her mother. Fish Tank brings the teenager and the older man together in an uncertainly defined relationship. But Connor is not all bad, as you can see in this scene. But you can't dance this fast. I'm back! Get up! I've got no shoes on. Excuses. Come on. Get up off of that thing and dance to you. Sing it now. Get up off of that thing and dance to you. You better. Get up off of that thing. 
The writer-director Andrea Arnold, who made an amazing thriller called Red Road before doing Fish Tank, gets all the way under the skin of her main character so that the movie is not about just a situation, but people. This is disturbing stuff, unexpectedly hopeful in its outlook. For a lot of reasons, I say see it. Good I film. agree, see it. and Because it really takes you into this girl's world. I mean, she, she's in a state of great emotional confusion and chaos. In the first couple scenes, she goes from violently attacking a, another girl to trying to free a horse that she thinks is being mistreated. So she's this mixture of rage and tenderness. And having a non-professionally trained actress play her is, I think, a really smart decision. Because she's great. A, and Arnold's direction, and, terrific. And, and she her, yeah. ca you can't always read her because she can't always read herself. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to me, th this movie reminds me of, of two other movies that we've, we've talked about from 2009. Precious Mm -hmm. for obvious reasons about uh, you know a, a young girl growing up in poverty and also the English movie An Education which tells a very similar story in I think a much more stylized and coy way. Right. This movie uh, really well, takes you into the reality of I this agree. Well, life. I think that really is apples and oranges because An Education is basically a high comedy in, in many ways. This is this is much more you know gritty kind of kind of neorealist drama. Yeah, it's yeah. shot like a documentary. There's no musical score and the truth of it really comes out. It feels really Great, realistic. Great fast kind of handheld camera work and yep. a narrow screen so you feel almost like this girl is trying to run out of the movie into yeah. some other life. Remember that, that name, Andrea Arnold, this writer-director. She's terrific. I think Red Road's even better than this film. I think so. this one's better than Red Road. I think they're both fantastic. I agree. She's right. a major talent. Coming up next, you know him as Santa Claus and Buzz Lightyear, and now he's a director. Tim Allen stars in Crazy on the Outside. You and I are going to see each other whenever we can. Christy? Ma, get in. I think he means me. Tommy, I want you back. That take us 12 million. Just got out of prison. And how's that going for you? Got a little mess on the poop deck. Our next movie is Crazy on the Outside, the directing debut of Tim Allen, TV's Tool Man, Toy Story's Buzz Lightyear, and the star of all those Santa Claus movies. Here he plays Tommy Zelda, who comes home from prison to stay with his sister, played by Sigourney Weaver, and her family. Grandma thinks that Tommy's been on a three-year trip to France. Speaking of France, Tom, you think you'll be going back there anytime soon? What do you mean? Well, it's just that, statistically speaking, people who go to France and then get out of France usually end up back in France. That joke can barely make it through one scene, but somehow it's stretched across the whole movie, as are other equally strained bits of humor that make 90 minutes feel as long as Tommy's jail term. Here, he pays a visit to his former fiance, Christy, who supposedly died while he was in the pen, and who is now seeing another former sitcom star, a fellow who also, come to think of it, did a voice in Toy Story 2. Hey, how come you didn't answer? You know how nervous I get when you don't answer. I was just about to jump in the shower. I probably didn't hear you over the sound of the water. Buzz Lightyear and Stinky Pete together again. This movie's plot is too labored and busy to bother with here. But the cast is kind of impressive. Not only Kelsey Grammer, Sigourney Weaver, and J.K. Simmons, but also Gene Triplehorn and Ray Liotta. Tim Allen must be the nicest, or at least the most persuasive guy in Hollywood to stuff them all into this turkey. By the way, Tommy's crime was pirating movies. I don't think there's any danger of that with Crazy on the Outside. Skip it. Skip it. Oh, my God, skip it. I mean, I mean th there's a shot early on where Tim Allen has to outrun a freight train, and it's just a quick blackout <laughs> gag, and you just think, okay, first of all, this doesn't belong in this movie. Secondly, you know, you know anybody... Is there anything in this movie that belongs anybody, in this well, movie? Anybody with a flip camera could have pulled off a better... It, it just absolutely goes clunk, you know, as a sidekick, yes, and you yes. think, this is what we're in for, and, and it is. It's, it's, it's this wildly overqualified cast working with this huge hunk of cheese. Terrible, terrible, It's terrible. terrible. It just drags... <laughs> Drags and drags and drags. I'm, I, yeah, I get bored just thinking about it. <laughs> Coming up next, two probable Oscar nominees are available to watch at home. That's in our DVD Out Now segment. And on next week's show, Mel Gibson headlines a movie for the first time in eight years almost with Edge of Darkness. Plus, Kristen Bell and Josh Dumel star in When in Rome. I've seen that look before. You're intimidated because I'm a model. You probably heard we ain't in the prisoner taking business. We in the killing Nazi business. And cousin businesses are booming. Now it's time for our DVD Out Now segment. This week, we're each highlighting some Oscar hopefuls. There were a lot of movies to argue about in 2009. The longest argument I had with myself was about Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. When I first saw it, I delighted in the verve of Tarantino's filmmaking and in some of the performances, especially Christoph Waltz's scandalously entertaining turn as Colonel Landa, as charming and loquacious a genocidal sadist as you'll ever want to meet. You're the Jew hunter. 
I'm a detective, a damn good detective. Finding people is my specialty, so naturally I worked for the Nazis finding people, and yes, some of them were Jews, but Jew hunter? <laughs> Just a name that stuck. But Tarantino's way of turning the horrors of history into the stuff of ultra-violent revenge farce bothered me. But on subsequent viewings, I've come to admire not only Tarantino's exuberant movie love, but also his sheer chutzpah. This is only a movie, and only in movies can you indulge a fantasy of justice for crimes that can never be answered. So I've come around on this uh, one Yeah, a bit. really? I'm still, I, I, it improves slightly for me the second time, and a lot of people love it. I, I think it's actually a fascinating phenomenon in that it's a big global hit yeah and so whatever issues I had with that leap into fantasy land at the end I don't want to give everything away you know I guess it's not not the issue for most people I I think there's something about Tarantino's approach to storytelling that keeps me from really kind of going with the ride on this mm -hmm. I think it's really just you know vignette set up kind of methodic, some of them methodically I, yeah. some the opening, set well the opening's fantastic it's yes. 20 of the best minutes I've and the, seen and the cellar the bar in yeah. the cellar scene and that's is it great too. <laughs> I think that's okay. about it <laughs> I think there's more okay there. my pick this week is The Hurt Locker now watch how director Jerry, Catherine Bigelow call. and actor Jeremy Renner work this I scene and you tell me if they don't know what they're doing are we moving? that's affirmative We don't know yet how the Hurt Locker will fare at the Oscars, but we do know that Bigelow's gripping tale of U.S. Army bomb doing? detonation experts just trying to stay alive in Baghdad is the first narrative feature to make dramatic sense of America's war in Iraq without polemics, without speeches, or really much of anything in the way of familiar melodrama. What's the best way to, to go about disarming one of these things? The way you don't die, sir. If you haven't seen it, see this film. Yes, this is an absolute must-see, and I really hope that Catherine Bigelow wins the Best Director Oscar. She will. Um, she will. <laughs> I think <okay>. she will. <laughs> She's up against her former husband, James Cameron, for Avatar, probably, but... Uh, right. But she will. <laughs> I, I think this is, a, this is really a great one. Yes. One for the ages. So, both Inglorious Bastards and The Hurt Locker are available now on DVD. And coming up next, the genesis of Darwinism. We'll review Paul Bettany and Jennifer Connelly in Creation. Supposing I think it should be destroyed. And you must do what you think is right. There is grandeur in this view of life. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. The actor Paul Bettany has already played Charles Darwin on screen, or nearly. In Master and Commander, he portrayed a fictionalized version of the naturalist accompanying Russell Crowe to the Galapagos Islands. Now, there was a true sense of discovery and the grandeur of nature in that film, and it's too bad there's so little of it in Creation, which deals with the real Darwin's life leading up to the 1859 publication of his opus on the origin of species. Jennifer Connelly, married to Bettany in real life, plays Emma Darwin, whose beliefs clash with her husband's increasingly godless worldview as we see here. Do you not care that you may never pass through the gates of heaven and that you and I may be separated for all eternity? Well, of course I care. Of course I do. What do you think has kept me in limbo all these years? The script by John Colley, who wrote Master and Commander, skips rather vexingly back and forth in time, focusing mostly on Darwin's grief at the death of his elder daughter of Scarlet Fever. She's played by a good young actress named Martha West. Suppose the whole world stopped believing that God had any sort of plan for us. Apart from anything else, it would break your mother's heart. Hearts can't break, silly. You told me that. And in some scenes, especially the tales of adventure Darwin retells as bedtime stories for his children, creation goes beyond the yellow highlighter debates between evolution and religious creationism and brings these people to some semblance of life. Mostly, though, director John Emile's workmanlike effort keeps a veil hanging between that life and the audience. It's a skip. I don't think this is well directed. It is a skip and it's I think a great missed opportunity yes. because here is a fascinating story, a story that could not be more relevant to today's world, you know, <laughs> where this this argument between science and religion or people's interpretations of science and religion keeps going on. And so Darwin, why does it, why does Darwin it work is for you? still a, a figure in that debate. Yeah. Well, partly because I think that 
so, I mean, this movie shows how hard it is for films to capture either artistic creation or scientific discovery. Hmm. And so instead of just sort of trusting the interest of the tale and the ideas and this guy, it has to dress it up with all, I mean, you know, he sees the ghost of his dead daughter, he flashes back to these adventures that he has, and right. then while he's writing, he's writing with trembling hand in the middle of the night, he's having hallucinations, yeah. he's having sweats and nervous breakdowns, and it's so over-dramatized well, that and, the real drama never really comes and through. And I think almost like extraordinary measures for my for my point. It's the, it's the it's the question for the writer and the director how much of this life and what kind of focus on the other lives are we going to try to pull off here? And I just feel like it's kind of ticking off the okay the domestic scene and back to the book. See, I think I've learned a lot more about science from extraordinary measures than I did from this movie. Not that I go to movies just to learn about I science. I love to learn. But <laughs> so you say. <laughs> Next up, a film that won a couple of awards at the Cannes Film Festival. Police adjective is a different kind of cop movie and not just because it takes place in Romania one of the few places in the world without a CSI franchise. <laughs> this is a subtle blend of deadpan comedy and tough social criticism about a young detective named Christy who has been assigned to follow some pot smoking kids. This second feature, written and directed by Corneliu Porumboyu, draws you in slowly and builds to an absurd and appalling climax in which Christy gets a lecture from his boss about the nature of his job and the meaning of words. <laughs> Police Adjective is a small movie, but its modesty and its simple, linear, realistic manner are deceptive. It's the kind of film you think about for a long time afterwards and want to go back and puzzle over again. See it. I say see it, too. I, I love it. It's a certain kind of sense of humor, yes. and, it, and, and I, hate, I don't want to culturally generalize, <laughs> but there's a certain strain of Romanian humor that runs yes. through all these very yeah. good films lately. It, it's a film, though, you have to recommend... Not cautiously, but the first you have to be patient with the this first movie. twenty minutes yeah. almost dares you to stick with it because so little happens, and you think, yes. "Is this going to pay off at all?" And I think it does. I <laughs> think it pays off. Hey, oh, yeah. uh, Porin Boyu did a similar thing in his first movie, 1208 East of Bucharest, which kind of meanders slowly around. The story gathers shape, and by the end, you're just kind of blown away. You're like, "Wow, yeah. I've never seen this before, and this is amazing." And I think we can agree that neither of these films is ever going to get remade as an English language picture. So <laughs> I, 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 it just doesn't feel know, like really? it's going to happen. You think? No, I, I no, don't but know. they're great. I, I think know. they're great. And I, I love, I love police agents. And if you go to atthemoviestv.com, we'll be doing a speed round of answering viewer questions. Click on web exclusives. Can't decide what to see in theaters? Stay tuned for my three to see. You're human. Closed captioning for At the Movies is sponsored by. The chill of peppermint. The rich dark chocolate. York Peppermint Patty. Get the sensation. Hotel provided by Park Hyatt Chicago. Chicago's award-winning hotel and luxury dining experience. Located in the heart of Chicago's magnificent mile on Water Tower Square. After the blizzard of big holiday movies, January is a month for odds and ends and hidden gems, which sums up my three to see this week. Number three is certainly odd. It's the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, Terry Gilliam's fantastical What's It, starring Christopher Plummer as a mysterious magician and Heath Ledger in his final role as a shifty con artist on a mind-blowing journey. Number two is another movie about the end of the world, Daybreakers, a sci-fi vampire horror movie with blood, suspense, and an ingenious premise. In a world where the human race has been hunted to near extinction and farmed for blood by vampires, Ethan Hawke, Claudia Carvin, and Willem Dafoe fight back against the blood-sucking powers that be. And number one is a diamond in the rough, Fish Tank from the English director Andrea Arnold, about a teenage girl growing up in a rough housing project and looking for love, or at least a way out. This is a harsh, powerful slice of life drama, well worth seeking out in theaters or on demand. Andrea Arnold is a name, I predict, Tony, that we're going to be talking about, I mean, I hope, you know, years and years from now. She is an excellent filmmaker. She's really got, and, I mean, and she works in a style that you think you recognize at first, you know, if you've seen Ken Loach movies or even Mike Lee movies, but she has her own touch and sensibility and way of, of getting into her character's minds. I think, and American realism, this sort of thing, tends to really hit the melodrama and the big dramatic points hard. And here, you just sort of believe it like you believe yeah. a documentary. Very yeah. good, very good. 
very good. That's it for now. We leave you with a recap of this week's show. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Just go to atthemoviestv.com to find out how. And join us next week for reviews of The Edge of Darkness with Mel Gibson and When in Rome, starring Kristen Bell. And until then, we'll be at the movies. All-you-can-eat pancakes are back at IHOP, starting at $4.99. And while you're here, try one of our four new flavored coffees. Activon Ultra Strength for powerful pain relief. A convenient applicator means no messy creams. Activon, applied directly where it hurts for joint pain, muscle pain, arthritis, and backache. What super fruit is taking America by storm? Sunsweet Ones. Prunes? Wow. It's packaged by itself. That's fantastic. This is delicious. Sunsweet Ones, the remarkable super fruit. A tax relief agreement can help you. I settled my tax debt for $800. For a free consultation, call 888-644-3116 now.